A vicious killer, rapist, and burglar stalked the streets of Southern California for a period of eight months, causing panic, fear, and frustration. The Night Stalker, as he became known, tortured, murdered, and perpetuated many sexual assaults, mostly in the name of Satan. This is the true story of that period in time when those on the West Coast believed this killer to be uncatchable. On June 28, 1984, 79-year-old Jenny Vinkow believed the night in the city would be very cool as a slight rain during the day allowed her to leave her bedroom window open before retiring for the evening. She settled into her bed, looking forward to the next day as her life seemed pretty uneventful since retiring. The following day, her son knocked on her door and received no answer. He then noticed that her bedroom window screen had been removed. Just then, the son tried to break down the door and finally succeeded. He discovered his mother dead, lying on her bed with her throat cut and stab wounds all over her body. With a sense of disbelief, her son called the police who brought with them the crime scene technicians and the medical examiner. This crime seemed random and the police were stumped. What they didn't realize was that this began a reign of terror in Los Angeles and the surrounding suburbs that no one was safe. A killer that prided himself on the worship of a dark entity invaded the homes of law-abiding citizens who grew into a society that wanted answers. Night Stalker, as dubbed by the press, caused a surge in gun sales and neighborhoods banding together for protection. It took the threat of brutal annihilation in the dead of night to bring the citizens together, but the story of his crimes and apprehension demonstrated a deviancy that marked a cold-blooded, merciless killer that eventually made mistakes leading to his capture. California, from the 1960s to the 1980s, became a haven for serial killers. The multitude of victims lured those interested in examining their most depraved desires and lusts. With these types of killers, authorities often look for patterns that may identify the type of individual and may, in some cursory sense, allow law enforcement to determine where the assailant may strike next. With the murder of Jenny Vinkow, authorities had no idea that the rampage would continue. In fact, all remained quiet for less than a year, and then the murderer reared his ugly head again. On March 17, 1985, Maria Hernandez, a young, vivacious Hispanic woman, pulled into her security garage within the upscale condominium complex at approximately 11.30 that evening. An assassin stepped from the shadows and leveled a firearm at Maria. He fired and she fell to the ground. The assailant walked over to her and then, having watched her and her roommate for a few days to memorize their routine, went to the young woman's residence to look for the roommate. Maria, luckily, only suffered a hand wound as the bullet struck, but her roommate would not be that lucky. When the assailant went to the condominium, once the door opened, Dale Okazaki encountered the phantom. Once the shot from the assailant's firearm landed on its mark, striking Okazaki in the head and killing her instantly. Maria discovered the body of her friend, and just as swiftly as the attack occurred, the killer disappeared. But this time, he wouldn't wait so long before striking again. Maria gave a description of her attacker as tall, gaunt, dark, maybe Hispanic. Again, police were perplexed. The authorities did not have to wait long until the killer struck again. He attacked within the hour after murdering Okazaki. Tsai Lin Yu, a Taiwanese-born young lady, 
drove down North Alhambra Avenue in nearby Monterey Park in her yellow Chevrolet when another car pulled up next to her. The driver of the mystery vehicle placed his car in neutral, forced his way into Yu's vehicle, pushed her out of the vehicle and shot her as she laid on the pavement. The young woman died instantly and the killer faded into the shadows. Police faced the challenge of identifying a killer who fit the description of hundreds of thousands of Los Angeles residents with a massive Hispanic male population on March 27, 1995. The assailant entered the residence of Vincent and Maxine Zazara, stabbing the couple to death and creating what newspapers described as a quote-unquote bloodbath. When their son discovered their bodies on the following day, he saw that the killer fired one shot into his father's head as the patriarch slept on the sofa. Maxine suffered greatly as the murderer carved on her face with a knife. When the police arrived on the scene for processing, the medical examiner noted the condition of Maxine Zazara's body. Her eyes were gouged out, and the empty sockets were ringed with blackened gobs of blood and tissue. The killer had plunged the knife through her left breast, leaving a large, ragged, T-shaped wound. There were other cruel injuries to her neck, face, abdomen, and around the pubic area. She had been butchered. On the outside of the house, police found concrete clues, footprints from what appeared as a tennis shoe in the service area in the flower bed where police gathered is where the killer gained entry into the home. Authorities made connections between the Zazara murders and those that occurred earlier and strongly believed the same killer responsible for the recent rash of violent murders. Of course, at this point, it was nothing more than a hunch, but firmly iterated the killer would strike again, becoming braver in his attacks. This is where the assailant would make mistakes in order for them to catch him. In the pre-dawn hours of May 14, 1985, Harold and Jean Wu, an elderly couple, slept in their beds when Jean Wu was awakened by a loud bang. When she arose in her bed, the intruder stood there with a smoking gun in hand. The intruder had already shot her husband in the head and he gave out slight groans. Before she knew it, the killer laid hard and indiscriminate punches into her face, pummeling her into near unconsciousness. The assailant then applied thumb screws and then began to punch her and kick her and demanded that she turn over any money to him immediately. Mrs. Wu then laid on her mattress and heard the intruder going through the furniture and expressing his disappointment that he found nothing of value with loud, vulgar expletives. Mrs. Wu could also hear her husband's gasps for air, almost as if he were punishing the couple for his inability to find anything of value to steal. Mrs. Wu lay across the bed, incapacitated because of her injuries and the thumb cuffs. The assailant, obviously frustrated by the lack of valuables in the house, violently raped the 63-year-old woman. The intruder then zipped up his pants and left the residence. When police arrived, Mrs. Wu described her attacker as tall, gaunt, dark, and Hispanic. This time, the Night Stalker's victims survived this brutal attack. The police and sheriff's offices were at a loss, although they still sought to capture this animal. When the investigation began in June 1985, one man, Detective Sergeant Frank Salerno, of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office Homicide Squad, knew how complicated workings of the murderer's mind were and knew that a serial killer was on the prowl in Los Angeles. Detective Sergeant Salerno, not long after the killings began, worked on his own to examine similarities amongst the killings that occurred up until June 1985. Salerno noted the similarities in the first six murders that took place, collected fingerprints, recovered shell casings of 22 caliber, the method of entry, imprints of the same tennis shoe, and the description of the killer was nearly identical in each case where he left witnesses. Tall, gaunt, dark, Hispanic, 
in his late 20s, early 30s, and downright ugly and seriously lacking any hygiene. What concerns Salerno at this point regarded the injection of possible devil worship and symbolism found at the latest crime scenes. During some of the attacks where the victims survived, the intruder forced them to utter phrases such as, I vow to Satan, and I love Satan, or he would have murdered them. Sergeant Salerno did not forget about the references to the rock group ACDC either, and their lyrics to a song entitled Night Prowler. The detective took his findings to his commanding officer. Captain Robert Grimm recognized the wisdom that his detective put into this investigation and suggested the detective bring his findings to the Los Angeles police investigating the Night Stalker murders. The LAPD said they would work with Salerno, but that each department should operate as a separate entity. However, they shared their findings with each other in the hopes that this collaborative effort could catch the killer and soon. Salerno consulted with two of his detectives at the sheriff's office with any information regarding the murders that occurred within their jurisdiction and engaged Detective Gil Carrillo, who had computer knowledge far beyond Salerno's expertise, who formulated a database to keep up with any new developments in the case. Another detective, Russell Uloth, helped Salerno determine a sort of profile for the killer. Both of these men proved invaluable to the eventual apprehension of the Night Stalker. As Salerno and his squad investigated further, these attacks actually occurred during the formulation of their squad. June 27th, Patty Higgins, 32 years old, Arcadia, California, killed in her home, her throat slashed. July 2nd, Mary Louise Cannon, 75 years old, Arcadia, California, found in her home, beaten, throat slashed. July 5th, Deidre Palmer, 16 years old, Arcadia, California, beaten at home with a tire iron, survived. July 7th, Joyce Lucille Nelson, 61 years old, Monterey Park, California, bludgeoned to death and mutilated in her house. Also July 7th, Linda Fortuna, 63 years old, Monterey Park, survived rape and sodomy attempts. When attacker could not get an erection, he robbed her home and fortunately let her live. July 20th, the Night Stalker committed three attacks. One, a Sawahim family, Sun Valley, husband Chitat, 32 years old, shot in bed at point blank range. His 29-year-old wife, Sakima, dragged from bed, beaten, twice raped, and made to perform oral sex. While bound, Sakima was forced to listen as the killer slapped her eight-year-old son in bed. Afterwards, the intruder departed with the family cash. Two, Max and Leela Needling, ages 68 and 66 respectively, murdered in their home. Three, Chainarong Covenant, age 32, murdered in home and sex offenses committed along with burglary. August 5th, Christopher and Virginia Peterson, husband and wife, 38 and 27 years old respectively, Northridge, California, both shot in the head while they were in bed. Both somehow survived, despite a bullet that penetrated a section of Christopher's brain and another that blew away Virginia's face. And August 8th, Ahmed and Sue Kiazia, husband and wife, 35 and 28 years old respectively, Diamond Bar, California. The intruder shot the husband in the temple and killed him in the couple's bed. His wife, Sue, was handcuffed, slapped, punched, raped, and forced to perform fellatio on the intruder. She survived. Also on August 8th, Elias Obawath, age 35, Diamond Bar, California, murdered in home, burglarized, and raped. Because of the continuation of the murders, the investigation expanded to the other areas surrounding Los Angeles where the Night Stalker continued to hunt. At the height of the investigation, 200 detectives became involved in the hunt for this ruthless killer. Salerno felt that the FBI could help with finding this person and asked for their help in gaining a profile of the killer. 
Salerno also enlisted those who had knowledge of devil worship and cult killings. While some detectives followed the line of inquiry into cults, they visited various groups at their meeting places and asked a lot of questions. Surprisingly, when two detectives visited one of the many meeting places of these groups, they located a size 11 footprint like that of many of the footprints at the crime scenes that may have matched that of the Night Stalker. Salerno hoped that the killer might feel the heat from law enforcement and then make a mistake. At a later press conference, Salerno announced the formation of the task force. By publicizing this task force that held all the most intuitive detectives that the killer would, indeed, make a mistake. When the citizens of Los Angeles and the surrounding areas first heard of the possibility of the serial killer within their midst, gun sales climbed. Families started moving in with each other for protection. Floodlights were hard to find and extra patrols were demanded by the public until this maniac could be apprehended. Salerno's unit distributed flyers with a drawing of the suspect and his habits known at the time. Another thing that became apparent to Salerno, the citizens acted more in aggression than in fear, and roving patrols of armed citizens actively engaged in finding the killer, especially at night. With all of the precautions taken by the citizens and the increased police presence, the Night Stalker obviously began to feel the pressure. Apartment complexes had armed guards in their lobbies. Police cars, both marked and unmarked, patrolled the areas once stalked by the killer, and the citizens exhibited a bravado, daring the killer to appear. On August 17, 1985, the killer hunted again as he drove his 1978 Pontiac Jalopy off Highway 80 and cruised neighborhoods adjacent to the thoroughfare near San Francisco, California. The Night Stalker found his way into a suburb where the darkness could hide his vehicle while he left it to hunt without being discovered. At this time, the assailant decided that he had better dispose of the vehicle and steal another one. But first, he went looking for victims. Armed with his 22 caliber handgun in his belt, he exited the vehicle and began walking. He reached a gangway in between two houses and decided he would try to enter the home of Mr. and Mrs. Pan. He drew his revolver and held it tightly in his hand, feeling the power that such a small piece of steel could wield in the hands of a homicidal maniac. He entered the Pan residence with relative ease and did what he called Satan's work. On the following morning, the Pan's son visited his parents' house and walked into a most horrible scene. His father lay dead on the bed, with his mother lying next to him. His mother was still alive, yet seriously injured. All throughout the home, the son found etchings of pentagrams, with the fifth star pointed downward. There also appeared messages of extreme profanity and one that drew his attention that stated simply, Jack the Knife. The son felt that the assailant may still be in the house, but then felt somewhat relieved when he noticed the side window had been pried open and dirty footprints bearing Reebok design on the sill of the window and the carpet adjacent to the window and trailed from that location to the Pan's bedroom and back again. Mrs. Pan survived the attack, but her husband was pronounced dead at the hospital. At first, the San Francisco Police Department believed that the Night Stalker's geographical reach extended, but upon further examination, the investigators realized that he may have visited the area a few times before. Detectives with the San Francisco Police Department requested that some of the bullet casings extracted from some of the Los Angeles area attacks be compared to the ones extracted from the pans. Detective Frank Kowalski of the San Francisco Police Department admitted to Salerno at the time that a 1978 Pontiac Grand Prix that had been seen in the neighborhood where the pans were found matched a vehicle that prowled some of the attack scenes in the Los Angeles area. Furthermore, four murders that occurred in the San Francisco area may have been connected with the murders and attacks in Los Angeles. On February 1, 1985, San Francisco authorities found the mutilated bodies of Christina Caldwell, age 58, and her sister Mary, age 70, where the two elderly ladies had been stabbed numerous times. The coroner's report indicated 
that the murderer made his way through a window and then rifled through their residence, obviously looking for valuables. Another murder occurred when the owner of a fashionable restaurant in the Knob Hill area of San Francisco, Masataka Kobayaki, age 45, was killed. And on June 2nd, Edward F. Wilgins, aged 29, died from a gunshot wound to the right temple while sleeping. His girlfriend survived the attack, but Wilgins' girlfriend, Nancy Breen, fought off the intruder who subsequently raped her. Just like Los Angeles, San Francisco law enforcement printed more leaflets and allowed more information to get to the press of the day in order to try and capture the killer. They also learned that a person matching the killer's description had stayed at a Fleabag Motel in San Francisco area the day of the Pan's killing. Witnesses described the man at the motel to be dressed all in black and reeked of body odor. Additionally, there was a five-pointed star, a pentagram, painted on the door of the room in which he occupied while in that city. Investigators found the same etching on the walls of the Pan's home. On August 25, 1985, just after midnight, the assailant, having already rid himself of the 1978 Pontiac, now drove a stolen 1976 orange Toyota and thought about how he had to move very quickly from the San Francisco area. He also reminded himself of the mayor of that city at the time and future U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein bragged to members of the press working with the radio media that the police were moving in very close to the killer. He also thought about how the sheriff of the local county department became livid with Feinstein for screwing up the dragnet to find the killer when she spoke prematurely. The killer headed to the suburb of Mission Viejo near Los Angeles. The Night Stalker knew that the police looked for him near San Francisco and decided he would go back near to his old hunting grounds, Los Angeles. William Carnes and his fiancée Renata Gunther slept peacefully, at least for the time being, in their home on Christiana Drive. The killer parked his car in the darkest part of the street and walked gingerly to the stucco home, looking for entrance to what appeared to be the bedroom. As the killer made his way into the bedroom, he smiled when he noticed the couple asleep. They were young, and his master, Satan, would be pleased with his choices. As the intruder took out his 22 revolver and pointed it to Karn's head, Renata Gunther awoke and saw the tall, gaunt, unhygienic stranger standing over her fiancé. The assailant made his way to the female who aroused him when he saw her laying in the bed. The intruder leaned over Renata, his putrid breath and body odor causing her to stir and finally awake. She opened her eyes and saw the stained and crooked incisors. The intruder then forced Renata into another room where he forced her on the floor and raped her. He kept telling her to, quote, swear to Satan, end quote, or he would kill her right there. Renata did as he demanded. Sickened and nauseated by the man's lack of hygiene and disgusted with his very presence, he finished and then forced her to perform oral sex on him before he left. Renata experienced a lot of pain, but at least she survived. The Night Stalker seethed back into the darkness from which he came. Back in San Francisco, a woman named Sandra Myers approached the San Francisco Police Department with an interesting tale that narrowed down the suspects to someone truly worthy of the moniker, Person of Interest. Myers, who ran a large house where boarders often resided, stated to police that she remembered a man who called himself Ricky. She described Ricky as a tall, gaunt, Hispanic, adding another word, strange. He closely resembled the sketch of the Night Stalker. Ricky explained to the woman that he hailed from El Paso, Texas, and traveled frequently throughout California, mostly between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Myers mentioned that Ricky expressed his interests in the black arts, witchcraft, Satanism, and the like. One day while noticing Ricky in the house's television room, Myers noticed that he took great interest in the news stories regarding the Night Stalker. When he noticed Myers standing behind him, he turned and stated to her with a mouthful of crooked and stained teeth, Now, 
Wouldn't you be surprised if I turned out to be the Night Stalker? Myers thought it strange, but then noticed the sketch really resembled her occasional border. A friend of Myers, Seraphin Arredondo, visited her one day at the residence sporting some jewelry that he had purchased from Ricky, a diamond ring, and some cufflinks. Claimed being strapped for cash, Ricky sold them to Arredondo at a discount. Arredondo read about the Night Stalker in the local newspapers and noticed that the killer stole valuables from his victims. He began to wonder. The police heard the story and asked Arredondo to hand the materials over to the police, which he did immediately. The police labeled the ring and the cufflinks as stolen property. Because Myers never knew when Ricky would show up next, plainclothes policemen staked out the residence day and night. As the police investigated the stories of Sandra Myers and her friend, the police near Mission Viejo took calls from people that noticed a late model Toyota, colored orange, prowling their streets prior to the attack on Carnes and Gunther. On April 27th, the police noticed that the vehicle was parked in a local parking lot and surveilled it until they made the determination that the driver had, indeed, abandoned it. After reading the surveillance of the car, the Orange County Sheriff's Office dusted the car for prints and the discovery proved fruitful. A new database that tracked prints came back with a hit. The prints on the car belonged to a man from Texas with a reputation among law enforcement there as being a small-time thief and malefactor named Ricardo Ramirez. The system pulled Ramirez's prints out of 380,000 in the database in a matter of three minutes. Now that the authorities had a name, they conducted background research to determine the characteristics of this man and asking questions as to whether this petty criminal may have made the leap to murder, rape, and torture. In actuality, before he committed the murders in May and June, it can be said that the police actually identified the Night Stalker and those killed during this period did not need to die. However, the killer remained elusive and paid attention to the news where reports actually documented police progress in the investigation. Ricardo Munoz Ramirez was born in what is known as the quote-unquote barrio, a word that describes a mostly Hispanic area of a city, of El Paso, Texas, on February 28, 1960. Ramirez grew up in poverty and was accustomed to being in youth gangs that stole to survive, allegedly. Ramirez was one of seven children born to an illegal immigrant, Julian, and his mother, Mercedes. Ricardo, the youngest of the seven, later Americanized his name to Richard as he got older. While in junior high school, Ramirez expressed little interest in anything else other than martial arts, heavy metal music, and Satanism. He often listened to bands such as Judas Priest and Black Sabbath and fascinated himself with stories of witchcraft. Ramirez's first official arrest came when police caught him with possession of marijuana. The police arrested him again for the same offense, and then a third arrest resulted as his driving recklessly in his friend's car. Ramirez served community service while on three years probation to get out of going to jail for the third charge. When his probation ended at the age of 20, Ramirez left El Paso. During the time he left Texas and becoming suspected in the Night Stalker murders and attacks, Ramirez had several brushes with the law. Also during that time, Ramirez adopted several aliases. When he left Texas, Ramirez adopted his trademark wardrobe of always wearing black and continued to follow his study of Satanism and witchcraft. He then began his rampage of murder in the hopes of satisfying the Dark Overlord. On the morning of August 31, 1985, Ramirez had just stepped off a bus that arrived from Phoenix, Arizona, where he went in the hopes of the pressure to capture him slowed down. Ramirez left to go to Phoenix also to buy some cocaine from a seller that he knew. Unaware that the police made a lot of progress in his identification, Ramirez went to a local liquor store to buy a beverage and spotted his face plastered all over the local newspaper in Los Angeles. He immediately rushed from the store without paying for the merchandise. But Ramirez could not leave fast enough, nor could he get away from the citizens that recognized him leaving the store. 
The people who spotted him pursued him through the streets and yelled, Stop! Killer! Halt! El Matador! Ramirez made his way through the Spanish neighborhood that he knew so well, and as it was Labor Day weekend, more people meandered through the neighborhood than normal. It would appear that people viewing the suspected killer alerted other neighbors to his presence, and he had nowhere to hide. People actually pointed fingers at Ramirez and yelled that he was the killer everyone had been looking for over the last few months. Ramirez began to run, and some of the witnesses flagged down a police cruiser and notified them as to his presence within the neighborhood. Bystanders witnessed the Ramirez at the corner of Euclid and Garnet. Authorities sent seven squads out possibly capture the elusive killer. When the police squads arrived, they searched from block to block for Ramirez and followed the leads given to them from witnesses around the neighborhood. Ramirez knew it was only a matter of time before the police closed in and arrested him. He began to feel a tightness in his chest, and for the first time since a youth, the devil deserted him to the masses he had so angered with his murderous sojourn. Historians surmised that Ramirez shamed his people with his indiscriminate murdering of a major city's residents, visiting them in the night and casting wholesale fear throughout the whole state. Ramirez stopped at one residence in an attempt to get away from the mob and begged the woman for help. She paused for a moment and finally recognized him from the newspaper she read that morning. The woman slammed the door in Ramirez's face. He had no choice but to keep running. Finally, with sweat and tears running down his face, Ramirez heard the sound of sirens coming from every direction it seemed, and he made his way to Hubbard Street, where a large crowd had already gathered. After a brief foot race, four concerned citizens, later considered to have been heroes, Manuel de la Torre, Jose Burgoyne, and his sons Jaime and Julio, captured Ramirez and one of them tried to beat the suspected murderer with an iron rod. Another neighbor, Faustino Pinon, fought off Ramirez earlier when he tried to steal his daughter's car from the front of his residence. Ramirez had been subdued, and he waited for the police due to the fact that he considered he may have been safer with law enforcement than the maddened crowd that cornered him. By the time the police finally arrived, the four men that captured Ramirez had him pinned to a curb and it appeared obvious that he had no fight left in him. Bleeding and badly wounded, police arrived and placed the suspected killer in handcuffs and placed him in the back of the cruiser. Ramirez kept stating to the police from the back of the cruiser, shoot me now, man, I don't deserve to live. Most believed that with the Night Stalker finally in custody, that the trial would be an open and shut case. But it would take almost two and a half years before Ramirez would be judged for his crimes due to legal maneuvering and continuances. Additionally, there were personal battles between Ramirez's attorneys, and his family interfered as well from El Paso. Accusations of bias and prejudice against Hispanics would rear their ugly heads, but everyone knew in their hearts that this was a case of murder and not race. In addition to the charges Ramirez faced, the local San Francisco authorities charged Ramirez with the murders of Mr. and Mrs. Peter Pan, and Orange County authorities charged him with murder and rape in the William Carnes and Renata Gunther case. District Attorney Ira Reiner stated, after Ramirez's arrest, finally charged the Night Stalker with 14 counts of murder, robbery, burglary, sexual assault charges. He also faced the robbery of another man in March of 1985, the kidnapping and rape of an eight-year-old girl on March 20th, and then the burglary of a home in Monrovia, California, owned by Clara Hadzall. Ramirez joined in the deterring tactics used by his defense team and requested that he be assigned other counsel. After his sister, Rosa Flores, stepped in to find an attorney that would represent her brother, the delays seemed incessant. In addition to the legal delays, Ramirez exhibited quote-unquote bad boy behavior in the courtroom that warranted numerous interruptions. Taxpayers became very frustrated with the defense tactics and the way the judge in the case, Elva R. Soper, granted every request for the defense to prepare for the case. What most people failed to realize 
is that if the prosecution were to gain a conviction, Ramirez's rights had to be safeguarded more than any other defendant due to the seriousness and heinous nature of his crimes. By the time the case came to trial, a new judge stepped up to the bench, Judge Michael Tynan. Judge Tynan was considered to be a conservative judge whose belief in fairness sometimes bordered on the fanatical, but no one could ever accuse him of being unfair or biased when it came to practicing as a trier of facts. With more delays, Richard Ramirez's trial finally began on January 29, 1988. Upon the beginning of the trial, Judge Tynan frowned on any further delays as justice had been delayed enough with the state of California versus Richard Ramirez. When the prosecution presented their case, 165 witnesses testified against the defendant. Even though Ramirez, cleaned and primed for his appearance at the trial, rested his demonic gaze on several of the witnesses, by the time all the evidence had been admitted and the testimony given, eight months after the first day of the trial, a jury deliberated for a short period of time and found Ramirez guilty on all charges. The jury recommended the death penalty. Ramirez cursed the court with his outbursts after the sentence had been rendered. You maggots make me sick, one and all. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. All that mattered in the end was that Ramirez would eventually pay for his crimes. Counsel for Richard Ramirez filed numerous appeals that were struck down in the respective courts over the years. Ramirez courted a woman by the name of Doreen Leoy, who corresponded with the convicted murderer 75 times. And in 1988, Ramirez proposed to her. The two would eventually marry in 1996. Leoy stated at the time that when Ramirez was executed, she would commit suicide. Well, Leoy left Ramirez some time later, and then the murderer started dating a 23-year-old girl. Richard Munoz Ramirez died on June 7, 2013, from complications as a result of B-cell lymphoma, a disease that originated from the multiple infections Ramirez experienced from hepatitis. From the outset of these vicious crimes, it appeared that Richard Ramirez grew up with two strikes against him from his birth. Perhaps looking for some meaning, he turned to the darker side of spiritualism and truly believed he found his way through murder, robbery, and rape. What comes from this episode in crime history is a diabolical individual that committed crimes without a modicum of human decency. It can be surmised that he never experienced human decency before. Why should he have done so during his crime spree? In all of our episodes, we stress that the victims and their families are the ones that actually pay for these crimes. Seldom does the perpetrator have that type of emotional or physical loss. Or, if they do, they just don't care. We agree with the latter assessment. Until next time.